Good morning. My name is Julie Bridges, and I am Cross Kids Children's Minister here in Poto. And I'm reading to you today the scripture Acts from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship, worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Ashdod, and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Yep, this is the word of the Lord. I don't know if you've realized this. We've been doing this for a little while where we start the message with the reading of Scripture. And I believe it was Claire who's on staff here who was the first one to suggest that we, that we do this. But we always end, we start with the reading of Scripture and we end with that simple phrase, this is the word of the Lord. And we do that because here at Cross Community, we have a high view of what Scripture is. We believe that Scripture is the inspired Word of God, and that, and that it was inerrant in its original writing. And so we believe that, that God has given the Scripture to us as the church to lead us and to be authoritative in our lives today. So we always end with, this is the Word of the Lord. It's not the Word of the guy who is writing it. It's not the Word of some random person. It's the Word of the Lord God. And just to always remember and to remind us how important and how reverent we should be towards Scripture. Really glad to be here this morning. My name is Brandon. I think I take it for granted sometimes that people know who the staff are and, and what we do. Um, but I'm, my name is Brandon. I'm over the worship and the production here at the church. I've been here for nine years. It's been great. I'm looking forward to many more years here. And I, I really love Cross Community Church. I love that I have the opportunity this morning to preach and to, and to get to communicate to you this morning. Um, we're right now in a series going and walking through the book of Acts. So the, uh, the book of Acts is incredible. It tells the, the story, and this is kind of like the, the overarching theme throughout the book of Acts. The, the book of Acts tells us the story of how the early church began, specifically through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that's really important. Everything that they did Everything the apostles did, the, the people that were in the churches, all the acts that we get to read about through this happened through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so, if you would, open your Bible to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we're kind of going to, we are going to give you, let me get mine there. If you've missed recently, it's okay, or if you've, this, maybe this is your first Sunday here, but just a quick, just overview of what's happened thus far. The beginning of, book, of the book of Acts begins with Jesus' commission to the church. He calls the church to share the gospel, to make disciples, 
Um, we see that happening. The church grows. The Holy Spirit falls on the church. And we kind of see this important thing happen first. First, the Holy Spirit and the gospel comes to the Jewish people. To the people who belonged to the oracles, the scriptures, uh, the temple, the worship of God first. To the people that God had chosen to bring about the gospel to the world. Uh, the gospel was given first to the Jewish people and the Holy Spirit and the promise of him to come. And so we see that, we've, so, we've seen that so far as we've read through the book of Acts um, last week, we ended with a story from a, about a man named Stephen who was a devout follower of God, who was a God-fearing man, who was um, powerful in the gifts of the Spirit, and who was full of wisdom. And so Stephen gives the most epic sermon that we've ever seen in the entire book of Acts. It's like really long. We couldn't make it through it all. Um, he, he basically works through the Old Testament looking at Abraham and all the things that had happened up to this point, pointing to the coming of the Messiah, giving them extra emphasis on how things were uh, meant to be seen as spiritually pointing towards the Messiah, and ends with a rebuke of the Jewish leaders at the time, calling them hard-hearted men who, uh, who did not listen and obey the Holy Spirit. As a result, those Jewish leaders at the time Someone's uh, crashed in the kitchen over there. Uh, those Jewish leaders at the time uh, immediately took Stephen out. They stoned him to death. Stephen became the first Christian martyr. And as a result, the church was scattered. So we're going to kind of pick that up. And also today, we get to see that the gospel was not just meant for Jewish people. God came, yes, first to the Jewish people. It was first given to them. But God's plan and his, uh, his vision for humanity was for the entire world to be saved through his son, Jesus. And so we're going to get to see the first convert from the Gentile people to Jesus today. We get to read that together. So let's start in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says, On that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the re regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And so the day of persecution is, is, again, it's the day that Stephen was martyred. And as a result of his martyrdom, this church that was thousands of people at the time that had been gathering together, that had enjoyed good times together, that had grown together, that had seen these great works and, and acts and the powerful uh, miracles through the Holy Spirit, this church was then scattered so as a result of Stephen's death, the church was scattered. We, in theological terms, we call this the, the diaspora. It's a really important point in the history of the church. Because like I said, the church was Jewish. At this time, they were together. And in, in our eyes, in human eyes, whenever this organization had been scattered, it should have spelled the death of the church and the death of this movement about this Messiah who had supposedly come. And I say supposedly because... Uh, Jesus was not the first person to come to claim to be the Messiah. Now, he was the only person to come who, who, who died, who lived a sinless life, and who was resurrected. But men had come before him claiming to be something that they were not. And so people at this time, and specifically the Jewish leaders even at this time, recognized that they, they thought this was just a fad. It was going to come and it was going to go. Much like some people thought the Internet was a fad in the 90s. They thought it was going to come and it's going to go. But well, listen, it was here to stay. So the, the Jewish leaders thought with the dispersion of the church, with the persecution that was now happening against them, surely this would spell the end of this movement about this man named Jesus. However, instead of spelling out the death of the church, the diaspora spelled out the flourishing of the church and the, and the expansion of the gospel from Jerusalem out to the rest of Israel, eventually out to the world. Um, unknowingly, these Jewish leaders did the will of God, which was to disperse the gospel. And so a great persecution, again, in verse 1, began in Jerusalem. They were scattered. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. Their hearts were broken, but they kept on going. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered went out about preaching the word. 
it was evident that the people that had been part of the early church, they'd seen all these great things. They'd experienced something, and, and they had experienced literally death from life, new life found in Christ. And they couldn't help but speak about it. They couldn't help but go out and preach the good news. So that's what they did. They scattered, and they went about preaching the word. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. So Philip is a guy. Now, he's new to the scene. What I love about this man named Philip is he, he gets a spotlight in the book of Acts, but he's not an apostle. He's not some great leader at the time. He's just a dude. He's a, he's a guy that's been dispersed out of his home, and as he's going, he can't help but tell people of the good news of who Jesus is. And so he goes first to the city of Samaria, and there he preaches. In Samaria, he comes with powerful works of the Holy Spirit who, had, who was at work in him. People saw these things. They heard the good news of the gospel, and as a result, they gave their lives to Christ. Now, Samaria is not necessarily a Gentile place. Um, in the eyes of the Jewish people at the time, um, it was honestly it was a very racially uh, charged situation where uh, the Jewish people did not like the Samaritans because the Samaritans, in their eyes, um, they were Jewish people who could not trace back their lineage. In other words, there were people who were supposed to be part of God's people, but they couldn't actually prove that they were part of God's people. And so in the eyes of the average Jewish person, they were worse than the Gentiles. Yet God sends Philip to these people who in the eyes of man didn't deserve anything, and he sends the gospel to them. As a result, the Samaritan people in this place are saved. It's incredible. Philip was not an apostle. Um, we kind of arrived, there was an apostle named Philip. Someone asked me about this between service. There was an apostle named Philip that, that walked with Jesus that was one of the 12. Um, but when the diaspora happened, when the dispersion of the church happened to the nations, the Bible tells us, we just read it a while ago, that the apostles stayed together in Jerusalem while the rest of the church was scattered. And I love that, that Philip was just this guy. He was a normal person like you and I. He was obedient to the Holy Spirit. Philip goes on. Let's look at verse 26. Just get, skip down just a little bit. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. So Philip first goes to the city of Samaria. He preaches the word. Then, apparently, the Holy Spirit speaks to him and tells him just to go south on this road. He doesn't tell him what for. He just says, go this direction. And Philip was obedient to the Holy Spirit, and he went. And it turns out as he was on his way um, to Gaza, he meets on the road a Ethiopian eunuch. And this guy is really actually very interesting. So, first of all, um, this guy was not a, a Jewish person by birth. Uh, yet it appears he was a God-fearing man, possibly a proselyte, someone that was in the, the process of becoming Jewish by tradition, but not Jewish by lineage or heritage. Um, so this guy was an Ethiopian eunuch. He was a court official of the Queen of Candace. So this, this was a guy of wealth. This was a guy uh, that was well off. This was an educated guy. He was Going along, he was reading scripture. So, so Philip is walking down the road, and there's a man on a chariot. So obviously, uh, like a chariot is not something that you see. It was, it was luxury at the time. I wonder how Philip felt as he sees this guy, if he felt out of place, if he was wondering if he'd even be able to communicate with him. This man is a, a 
was a learned man. I don't know Philip's educational background. I don't know, but he was just being obedient to God. But this man had uh, access to the scripture. Now, we take that for granted today because we can take our phone and download hundreds of different versions of the Bible right in front of us. Uh, Yet at the time, just having access to scripture was something that only a few people had. So he had a scroll. He was reading from it. He was coming from Jerusalem. So most likely what this meant was that this Ethiopian eunuch must have had favor with the queen at the time to get a little bit of time off to come to Jerusalem to worship God there and then to return back. What I think is really interesting about this Ethiopian is that even though he believed in God, even though he had come to Jerusalem and taken time and money to come and to be, to be there, uh, he was a man who was denied full acceptance into the Jewish community because he was not Jewish. So a Jewish person or a, a person that wanted to worship God could come. They could come to the temple. They could make their sacrifices. They could do all these things, but they were only allowed in the court of the Gentiles. And there were two other rooms inside, actually three other rooms inside, that they were not able to even enter into because of, of who they were, because of the lineage of who they were. And even being a eunuch was also another mark against this man. Yet he followed God, and we're going to see that where in the system of Judaism he could not have full acceptance, he's going to get full acceptance with Christ. And I love it. So it says that uh, he was returning and sitting in his chariot in verse 28 and reading the prophet Isaiah. It says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I? Unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. It says in verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? So Philip, again, he's on the road. He meets this Ethiopian eunuch. He feels, he hears the Holy Spirit tell him, go up and speak to this man. He hears that he is reading the prophet Isaiah. It tells us that this Ethiopian was learned in Scripture And he was interested in the Messiah, yet he didn't know who the Messiah was. This this would have been a popular scripture that was pointing toward the Messiah and that people were trying to understand. So the Ethiopian is interested in the Messiah, yet he has no idea who Jesus is. So this is like a prime opportunity for Philip, right? Philip's a believer. He's a man who's obedient to God. He's a man who knows of the Messiah. And here's a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with someone. And so Philip does just that. It says, then Philip opened his mouth in verse 35. And beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. So Philip sees and has this opportunity to share the gospel with this man who is obviously interested in this Messiah. He opens the eunuch's eyes to the truth of Scripture, to how this specific Scripture points to the Messiah, who is Jesus, who had come, who had lived the perfect life, who was the Son of God, who gave his life as a sacrifice on the cross. He died. Three days later, he was resurrected to new life. And as a result of Jesus' sacrifice and his resurrection, and, and as a result of our faith, put into Christ, we can have new life. Philip shares this life-changing truth 
with the Ethiopian. He can see he was in darkness, but now he can see he was dead, but now he is alive. And the Ethiopian placed his faith into Christ, and immediately he says, look, we're here. Here's water. Why not be baptized now? Philip obliges and takes him down, and they are baptized right then, or uh, the Ethiopian is baptized right then. And the Ethiopian becomes the first non-Jewish Gentile person to accept faith in Christ. This is huge. I think this is really interesting because in our eyes, like we're here gathered together, together 2,000 years later, we are Gentile people. We are not Jewish people by origin. And, and so we kind of take it for granted that like, yeah, obviously it was God's plan to save the whole world through Christ. Yet this was very mysterious to people at this time. I found it really interesting. My small group is walking through the book of Ephesians right now. And Paul keeps talking about the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the gospel. And the mystery to, of the gospel was the fact that God was pulling together all of humanity into one man together. Jew and Gentile, no longer was there a barrier between the two, and he was instead making a new church. And this church and this people that he was making through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and through the gospel and through the life-changing truth of who Jesus is was God's vision for mankind until the end of time, until we get to be with God forever. And so to us, it's not very mysterious, but to many of these Jewish people, their minds were blown, and in fact, some of them had a hard time accepting and understanding that God's son, Jesus, died not just for the Jewish people, but for all of the people. Philip may have had that own, uh, that own thought and that own idea in his head, yet he was obedient to the Holy Spirit to share the gospel with someone that maybe he didn't even understand needed the gospel. And as a result, this man was saved. And as a result, we get to see in the book of Acts from this point forward, the gospel grows not only in Jewish communities, but is eventually going to be grown outside and eventually going to be spread to um, all over the rest of Asia, into parts of Europe, and eventually, I mean, we're here today, to the rest of the world. It's this really beautiful, awesome thing um, that happens and that Philip gets to be a part of. And then uh, Philip, again, obedient to the word of the Lord, obedient to the Holy Spirit, goes on and continues to preach the gospel all the way until he came to Caesarea, and apparently he spent a little bit of time there. And I love this story. This is one of my favorite stories um, in the book of Acts because, because of the growth of the gospel, um, because of the sincerity of the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, because of the honesty and the the willingness of Philip. And uh, there's just a few things for us to remember because we're, we're talking big picture things here. Um, again, the promise of new life in Christ was given first to Jews, um, but the vision of God was to save the whole world and all of humanity through the person of Jesus. And so we see that here. Um, we see that not every time that someone hears the gospel do they see miraculous things on the front end. So you remember, Philip goes to Samaria. The Spirit worked through him for some reason. I don't know why. It's just how the gospel was spread. In Samaria, Philip did miraculous things. People were uh, healed. Right? They saw things that defied their view of what nature should have been. And they, as a result, realized that this gospel and what Philip had to share had authority. Right? But with with the Ethiopian, we don't see anything like that. We just see Philip being obedient and simply sharing the word with, with the Ethiopian. I think what's important to, to realize here is that what gives us authority is not miracles, but it's the word of God itself. What we should be looking at and expectant of is not miracles, but the greatest miracle that happened in both of these stories, both in Samaria and with the Ethiopian eunuch, was that they were brought from death into life. And that miracle is far greater than any of the healings that took place. God does what he does. Miracles could still happen today, and they do. Uh, yet the focus was not the miracles. The focus was the gospel itself. 
The focus was on Christ this whole time. And then there are two things that we can learn from the life of Philip. Two things we learn from the example of Philip. First was his obedience to the Holy Spirit. So he listened to the Holy Spirit. So first of all, he could discern the voice of the Holy Spirit in his life. Second, he was obedient to that voice in his life. Let me ask you, when's the last time you have heard God speak to you? When's the last time you heard God say something to you and as a result you were obedient to it? Because those are two different things, right? You may hear the word of the Lord. You may hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you, but you may not be obedient. But Philip was both. I can tell you that I have never heard God speak audibly to me, but I've heard God speak to me in different ways. The first time I can really remember specifically hearing God speak to me would have been when I was saved, when I was about eight years old. And I don't know how it happened. I don't know why it happened, but that night I was sitting at my grandfather's house. My mom was tucking me into bed, and I didn't hear God audibly, but I felt something within me. And all of a sudden I had this realization that I was a sinner and I had already been to church. We grew up in church. I'd already heard the gospel. Um, Yet at that point, for whatever reason in my life, the Holy Spirit gripped my heart with that truth and I knew that I needed Jesus. And so I told my mom and she prayed with me and I accepted Christ that night. Um, That was just a, a real small voice. Even at the time, I don't know that I knew that that was God speaking to me, but in retrospect, I can I can know. Um, because it's happened since then. So when I was in high school, I, um, I, was dis- I, was, I had a plan for my life, right? Like you're in high school, I was a, a junior, and, you know, you already have guidance counselors asking you, you know, where are you going to college, what's your major, you know, so on and so forth. And so I had an idea, and I had a plan for my life. And at that point in my life, I was trying my best to follow God. And I remember thinking, wow, I have never asked God, what do you want me to do with my life? Like, what's your plan for my life? What is your will for me? And so I just began to simply pray that. Um, I prayed almost every day, and I simply prayed, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Simple prayer. And then I would would literally, I would bow down in my room or wherever I was, I would pray that, and I would just be silent for a little while, trying to listen. And... Sometimes I felt like there was nothing, you know, that I was praying that I couldn't hear anything. Um, Sometimes I'd start to feel a little bit of something. It was never, again, audible, it was something within me. And I was really wary because I felt like God was calling me to ministry. I didn't think that I had the skill set to do that. I never saw myself standing in front of people preaching and even being able to to make intelligible words up here. And so I thought, that's not for me. And so at first, my my reaction was, I'm just thinking that, and that's not what God's calling me to do, because that doesn't even make sense. Yet I continued to pray that, and I continued to feel that, and feel like God was calling me. It was He speaking in my heart. And it got stronger. And it was about a year I prayed for a long time because I didn't want to be one of those persons that, you know, went to church camp. They had that big, like, night where they're like, are you called to ministry? And then everyone walks forward, you know, and you got friends up there. Everyone's called to ministry. Um, I didn't want to be the type of person that thought I was called to ministry, and then a month later, a few weeks later, that it just fizzled out. So I really prayed about it for a long time. Um, I prayed about it for a year, and the feeling just got stronger and stronger. And the best way I can kind of explain it is there's a time after uh, there's a time after Jesus has died, and there's two guys that are on the road to Emmaus, walking to Emmaus, and Jesus appears to them, but, but they don't know it's Jesus. And this is a really interesting story. Um, they're kind of talking about what had happened. They're bewildered at the whole thing about like Jesus is dead now, and this guy starts asking them questions again. They don't realize it's Jesus at the time, and he begins to open their eyes to Scripture. And so they're reading Scripture, and they're finally coming to an understanding of who the Messiah is, even though they didn't realize they were standing right next to the Messiah. 
And eventually their eyes are opened, they realize it's Jesus, and it was like this really big miraculous thing that happened. But the two guys, they wondered in bewilderment with each other when they said, as he was speaking scripture to us, were not our hearts burning within us? And that's the best idea of what I can give of what it means to hear God whenever you're reading scripture or whenever you're praying. It's like this burning in your heart. It's something that you should be careful of because it can be subjective, absolutely. And it's something that we need to grow in discernment and we need to grow in the knowledge of the word because God never calls us to do something that is in contrast to what his word says. But God speaks to us in the stillness and in the quiet. God calls us to to be out of our comfort zone. God can speak to you audibly. Maybe that's happened to you. It's just never happened to me. But the thing is, as we see, the the book of Acts, again, is the story of how the early church began through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We come to understand that as believers, we're supposed to hear God speak to us. We're supposed to be people who are listening to our God. And when he calls us to do something, we are supposed to be people who are obedient to the Holy Spirit. And any time we feel like God is telling us something, we can always compare that to the truth that is from Scripture. Because we know that this is also the word of the Lord. The second thing that we learn from the example of Philip is his eagerness to spread the gospel. Philip had experienced that life-changing truth. Philip knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Philip himself had gone from death into life through the gospel and through Jesus' resurrection. And what I love about him is that he could not help but go out from being kicked out of his home, being dispersed from a church that I'm sure he loved at the time, now out by himself, maybe a few believers here and there, but he could not help but share the good news of Jesus because it had changed his life. It's completely possible that the faithfulness of Philip preaching Christ to the Ethiopian led the nation of Ethiopia eventually to Christ. So this man who was the Ethiopian eunuch, here's the gospel from Philip, was a man who was in high stature and was in the court of the queen at the time, It's absolutely possible that he went back proclaiming that same gospel that he had heard. We don't know what happened after this. The Bible doesn't say. But we do know that in AD 330, Ethiopia declared Christianity as its main religion. And though it took time, it's absolutely possible that the seed that Philip planted in this Ethiopian was eventually a seed that bore fruit in Ethiopia. His eagerness to spread the gospel led to other people experiencing the same Jesus that he had experienced. And yet I can't help feel sometimes, and I I speak not just to you but to myself, that sometimes we lose the urgency in in our eagerness to spread the gospel. I know why. It's hard. Sometimes we don't have the right words. We don't feel like we've been trained well enough. We're nervous Spreading and sharing the gospel with someone, especially if it's someone that we know, sometimes means that we're putting our relationship with him on the line. But the truth is that we are only here on earth for a short time. That one day we're going to be in heaven with Jesus, and we're not going to have those opportunities any longer to share the gospel with the people that we love, the people that we work with, the people that are family. And I don't know exactly how heaven's going to be like, and I know that that. We'll be free of the pain, but I can't help but wonder if we will regret the times that we skipped on sharing the gospel with someone because we were too scared. As believers, we are called to spread the gospel. and We should have an eagerness about that. So that leads into this simple application. First is that we have a responsibility to share the gospel. Philip was just a regular guy. He wasn't the church leader. He wasn't this... I mean, he, we don't know. He, he may have been educated, he may have not been. But he was just a guy who was obedient to the Holy Spirit. He was a guy who had an eagerness to share the gospel. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus tells the church, and these are actually his final words before he leaves and before the book of Acts begins. 
He says in Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's called the Great Commission. You've probably heard that before, but if you hadn't, that's the Great Commission. And the the words that Jesus spoke weren't just to the apostles. They weren't just to the elite. It was a command that he gave the entire church. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The responsibility to share the gospel rests on my shoulders, and it rests on your shoulders. Second point is the responsibility doesn't only fall on the staff's shoulders. A lot of times when we're thinking about sharing the gospel, we think, well, can I just invite people to church? And listen, that's great. Absolutely invite people to church. But we're called to do more than that. We are called to share the gospel. It doesn't just fall on the shoulders of the elite, the trained people, the leaders of your church. It falls on your shoulders because only you are gifted enough and only you have the right circumstances to speak the truth of the gospel into someone else's life. We should use the relationships that we have and the trust that we have to leverage that, to point people to Christ and to to who he is. I guarantee you, if you have a friend or a family member Um, bringing them to church is good and they should hear the gospel here but the most effective way to communicate the gospel to them is through your through your own words broken maybe unsure of scripture and what you can point to maybe but your testimony is powerful you have the responsibility to share the gospel the last thing is I challenge you to begin to pray for someone right now who do you know that isn't a believer how do you know they're a believer this is a good question Um, i know that we live in the bible belt and that there's a church on every corner yet there are people that live in lafleur county that live in poto right now that don't know who christ is get this um someone was telling me earlier Uh, that their husband's mother lived in Oklahoma for three decades and had never heard about Jesus. Someone had lived in Oklahoma for three decades and had never heard about Jesus. This This is a crazy story. This person even grew up in a Catholic church. Now, I don't know their involvement there, but apparently the truth of the gospel had never made it to them. I don't know all the circumstances around that, And it wasn't until her son came and began to explain to the gospel that she began to understand. And she was saying, wow, I've I've never heard this before. Like, who in your life do you think should know the gospel but you're not sure? Ask the questions. Ask them if they know about Jesus. Ask them if they know that he was the son of God, that he died on the cross for their sin. Ask them if they understand the resurrection and the new life that they have in Christ. Don't just assume people understand the gospel or are saved. Have the conversations. Who do you know that desperately needs the gospel? If that's nobody, if you can't think of a single person in your life that doesn't need the gospel, I think you have a problem. We as believers are called to be in the world, but not of the world. So that means we are around people that don't know Christ, that are far from Christ. It doesn't give us license to sin. Um, It doesn't give us an opportunity to just live like the rest of the world. But we're at least supposed to be in the world enough that we're rubbing shoulders with people who are far from God. And we're having the opportunities to share the gospel with them. I don't know what that looks like for you. uh, But if you don't have anyone to share with and you can't think of anyone, I would say, again, pray about that. Pray that God would send people into your life that are far from him. Maybe it makes you uncomfortable. Maybe the way they speak, the way they act, the things that they do make you uncomfortable. And that's okay. Lost people act like lost people. But our job is to spread the gospel to them, to share them with them the incredible life-changing truth about Jesus. And I pray this across community church that we're not content with just meeting here one hour a week, patting ourselves on the back and thinking we're just good Christians. 
Like, yes, coming to church, being a part of this. This church is the representation of God's kingdom on this earth. We worship together corporately. That's important. We come together. We sit under teaching. That's important. But then we go out and we live out our faith. We go out and we spread the gospel. We look for opportunities to share. We take time daily to speak to God, to pray to him, but to listen to him, to learn to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit within us, to be obedient to Scripture, to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and to God, and to look for those opportunities to share. I guarantee you, if you find yourself praying and asking God for opportunity, he'll give it to you. It's in that time that it's your responsibility to to be obedient to him. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for today. And God, I thank you for Cross Community Church. And Father, I pray that you would use us in a powerful way in LaFleur County, wherever we live, in whatever circumstances we're in. God, I pray that you would use us to spread the gospel to people. And God, I pray that you would speak to us. God, I, I pray that we would be obedient to you, that we would step outside of our comfort zones. God, I pray these things in your holy name. Amen.